Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's ETH Zurich Global Lecture. My name is Chris Lubkamin, and I have the privilege to be the host of a conversation with our amazing guests today and also to be the head of strategic foresight at the ETH Zurich. The ETH Global Lecture Series offers a platform for contemporary global topics with outstanding global speakers, global thinkers to be engaged. In a nutshell, we invite an interesting external person to speak on something topical, to share their personal insights based on their experiences and on their expertise. The goal is to provide an outside in perspective, kind of a deep dive into something which we think is really quite interesting for all of us. Today, we're feeling massive change across about just every aspect of our lives. All of us are sitting or standing or kneeling or lying down in some place we probably didn't imagine we would be or would have been a year ago. What changes have had the greatest impact on all of us? Will it be the new geopolitical landscape, new techno technological disruptions, climate change, all three? What else? How can we avoid being blindsided by these forces and their complex interplay? It's quite fascinating because we shape the future and at the same time, the, sh the future shapes us. We are connected to it and to each other through forces that seem invisible, but actually we feel them every day. So what does our connected future hold? The big question is, how can we be better prepared for tomorrow? And who better to help us answer these questions and so much more than my friend, Dr. Pradag Khanna, a best-selling author and managing partner of the strategic advisory firm, Future Map, based in Singapore and working around the world. And Dr. Miriam Don Cavelti, deputy for research and teaching at the Center for Strategic, excuse me, the Center for Security Studies and senior lecturer for security politics at ETH Zurich. So welcome to both of you. It's great to have you. Thank you, Chris. It's a pleasure. Well, I, I really can't wait. I wish we could talk for like three hours instead of one, but we're gonna get go to it. So Parag, you have spoken and written quite a lot about connectivity. Just what is connectivity and why the heck is it so important? Well, first of all, Chris, thank you so much for inviting me to join you. And I understand this is the first uh, of the uh, lecture series of the year. So I'm honored to uh, help kick off the year. Maybe we'll make it optimistic in tone. Um, and hopefully we'll get to do this in person again before the year is out. But again, thank you. I have an amazing amount of respect uh, for ETH and its standing in the world. And one of the great things about ETH, uh, where it's again been ahead of the curve, is actually in complexity and foresight studies. And it's great to see that that is you know, really your full-time uh, position now. I think it really cements uh, your institution's uh, leadership in that area. So I can't wait to, to get into this. And connectivity really is a foundation uh, for those conversations about the future. Because to me, connectivity is actually one part of the fundamental essence of what it is to be human, is the desire to connect. Now, let's remember that this is not obvious. We have reams of literature telling us that the essence of human being human is to be tribal, to seek division, to uh, you know break ourselves up into smaller and smaller communities, whether they are ethnic or geographic or political, and yet that is uh, very strongly contradicted by the evidence that as a human impulse fundamentally we seek community, we seek to bond with each other, we build relationships and communities all the time. We have been doing so continuously. Since uh, the Homo, since uh, Homo sapiens wandered out of Africa about 100,000 years ago, in fact, the physical evidence, and I want to get to the physical dimension of connectivity, all physical evidence that we have of human civilization relates in 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 some way to us building uh, transportation corridors. We've got the Roman roads, we have the Silk Roads, we have cities, all places, and um, and physical. Um, uh, legacies of how we connected to each other. And every era of history is marked by ever more technologically sophisticated mechanisms of installing 
and maintaining connectivity. And it could be, again, roads, railways, uh, airports, uh, uh, ports and shipping, and obviously fiber optic internet cables. So let me get to the point about the, now the physical side. I, I deeply believe that therefore connectivity is a human impulse, right? The, mm. the arc of history, as some might say, bends towards connectivity. But let's talk about the physical dimension. If you had to explain connectivity in a physical sense, I would break it into the categories of transportation, uh, energy, and communications, roughly. There's others, but physical transportation, infrastructure, whether within a country or across borders, but between human settlements, uh, energy, right? We only had, uh, oil and had oil and gas pipelines for the last century or so. And now communications from telegraphs to telephone wires, the fiber optic internet cables, satellites. So infrastructure is the physical embodiment of this, uh, of connectivity and our desire to connect ever more. And, uh, and so that in, in a nutshell, right? And, and again, let's remember that we invest as a human species, as all the countries, governments, nations, companies of the world, more than double every year in these assets, these infrastructural assets that embody connectivity, more than double as we do on all, with all of the military budgets on earth combined. So we, we take for granted that which we often do not see, especially today for all the young people listening in. To you, productivity might just mean this, and there's no wire, right? But you do not get to talk or use this without connectivity, right? Physical things connecting to other physical things, invisibly or physically. So connectivity is truly everything. But, and what I'm sure we'll get into is, it gives rise to all of the fast paced feedback loops and complexity of the world today. If we didn't have connectivity, we wouldn't have such a complex world. These are two sides of the same coin. Yeah, so let me just, I want you to pop forward because you, you mentioned Roman roads, you mentioned our ascension out of Africa, you know, to, and how we search for these two poles, if you will, the physical and metaphysical connectivity, the search. But if you look forward 10, 20, 30 years, where do you think connectivity is going to be heading? I mean, just zoom forward, help, help us think about that for a second. What, what do you see? I would say within and without, and I loved your line at the beginning saying, you know, we shape the future and the future shapes us because now we have the capacity more and more to think about the future and act in accordance with what we think will happen in the future based on what we might do today. And that capacity continues to grow and therefore that feedback loop accelerates. But obviously connectivity is coming to a biological organism near you, meaning yourself, right? <laughs> we are gonna have more and more connectivity within us. We have embedded uh, chips and devices and trackers and RFID and even the ability to communicate now with the internet, with headsets that wrap around your ear and feel signals and communicate through your jawbone and things like this. Um, and then obviously we will have ever more connectivity in space. There are thousands of satellites and, and more and more. So every part of the world will be coated with connectivity. And we can see this, you know, again, so from our physical space to our biological space, there's a long way to go in how we use different kinds of connectivity. And I should add, some kinds will be exhausted, will no longer be necessary. You know, the, the, um, there's a growing number of oil and gas pipelines that are redundant in the world today. There are countries that are moving so fast towards grid parity and uh, zero emissions and alternative energy that we no longer use some kinds of connectivity. We don't use the telegraph cables uh, in the under the Indian Ocean anymore either. So yeah. we're always in a process, always, this is part of our evolution, yeah. right? Our socio-technical evolution. We expire and exhaust and uh, make redundant some kinds of connectivity and we build and integrate new ones. I, I love that where you, you took that connectivity and you, as you said, you went really micro inside and also bl blast it out to space, literally and figuratively. And so to really help us remind us that that connectivity happens at all sorts of levels. And what I'd like to do is at this moment, give Mir Miriam, what does, it, what, what does that make you think about when you hear Parag talk about this? 
Because you look at these things. Did you see me take notes? I took lots of notes. <laughs> I did. I, I actually must confess I was watching you take some notes. So I knew you had some thoughts for this one. So here No, we go. I actually also just wrote down some of your thoughts, Parag, because they very much connect to what I am also mainly interested in. One of the aspects that I study is cybersecurity, and especially this uh, question of where, it, where we're going with cyberspace, if you want to call it this. This is exactly what we also observe, you know, the going at just the growth of, of this through connectivity into much more devices and into the body. I think that is super important. But I also study the downsides of this. Um, as a security scholar, we are, of course, interested in peace, but we're also interested in understanding where, you know, conflict arises from. And I think it also becomes interesting if we now maybe become slightly less optimistic and think about the potential downsides of this. The people that are going to be left behind is always one of the issues because connectivity does not affect everybody the same way. Uh, that is also an aspect of, you know, uh, kind of contrasting the global uh, to the local and the, the, the physical, the, the human body and, you know, the different political aspects of this. Um, but also um, I, in my studies, I very often also look at politics and how they deal with certain new issues. Um, there's, you know, positive and negative aspects there as well. But I think we have to be very much aware that there are forces outside of the political, but that the, the future is hugely political. And you both said, you know, we shape the future. So this, the decisions that we take um, now about the future have a huge impact uh, on the whole ecosystem. And I don't think that there's a clear understanding sometimes of the, well, the disruptive effects that politics can have. So even though I fully agree with everything that Parox says, I do feel that we have human forces that deliberately sometimes want to uh, disrupt connectivity uh, for whatever reason, you know, there's different political reasons. Sure. I'd love to uh, respond to that if I could, because uh, I think it's extremely important to to uh, not only to, to just to second what you said, Miriam, because in fact, very often people posit that globalization is a rosy and positive story of um, you know flourishing connectivity, always for peaceful and positive ends, whereas geopolitics is about division and separation and conquest. The truth is that throughout history, connectivity has been an imperial enterprise. We would not have globalization today were it not for imperial expansionism. Uh, the Mongols, the most rapacious empire in history, were also those that nurtured the Eurasian uh, Silk Roads, right? The purpose of the Dutch, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the British, uh, in, uh, infrastructure building, their, their, their network of ports and the East India companies was all leveraging globalization and connectivity for conquest. So to me, what you've said is very important because it highlights that connectivity, because I did not want to imply at all that it's entirely peaceful or positive. In fact, globalization and geopolitics are absolutely two sides of the same coin. And today, therefore, the more connectivity we have, the more competition we will actually have to control that connectivity. In fact, we are competing every single day in what I call a tug of war. And the tug of war is to gain the maximum share of the revenue from the supply chains and infrastructures that connect us to control the data flows and traffic, uh, to harness that data, to own it, uh, to exploit it, uh, and to profit from it. So every day is a story more and more of a competition, a cutthroat 24 seven competition to control connectivity far more so than it is a competition to control borders. We have very, very few outstanding international territorial boundary conflicts today. I'm not gonna say they're insignificant, but they are very, very few. We do not wake up in the morning worrying about pretty much any of them, right? Um, whereas every single day, day and night, 24 seven, there are humans and there are bots and there is AI out there attacking uh, each other's infrastructure and supply chains and, and so forth in order to control connectivity. So, uh, you know, Miriam, you're by studying, you know, cybersecurity, I, I sometimes call it the geopolitics of the internet, right? Um, it, it's a story of more, 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 more connectivity, bringing more good things, but also more connectivity, bringing more bad things. 
No, that's really fascinating. So the question then is, and we're looking forward, is, it, is, is there a limit? Because we see like at the end of the day, when we go back to the Roman road, at the end of the day, you can only build, well, you, you could, the road, the road construction ends at some point. You've built the, you've built the road structure. You can keep getting finer and finer and smaller and smaller. But when you're looking forward, Prague, how does that look? Well, you know, infrastructure is a special category. You know, it, it, it changes hands over time. One of the things that I've documented is that infrastructure very often outlasts the countries that build it or control it, right? So there are oil pipelines across the Middle East that were created or laid down prior to the existence of, of uh, countries in the Levant region. And those countries have collapsed, fallen apart, or failed states, but the pipelines are still there. So the truth is that what those, those physical things that we build today with infrastructure can have a greater shelf life than our notion of the state as the, as the deepest, most fixed and rooted and central actor or unit uh, in global politics, I tend to, to I tend to disagree. So again, the internet and internet cables will outlast the existence of many countries, right, uh, and so forth. So you know, looking into the future again, these infrastructures are what will ultimately be competing over more and more. It could be financial markets, it could be the control of cities and the economies of cities, um, all of these. And again, you know, th these infrastructures, as I said, change hands. So. I served in Iraq and Afghanistan briefly, uh, you know, when I was advising the U.S. Special Operations Forces in the Pentagon. And uh, let's remember what happened to those bases. I lived on bases that are no longer controlled, that were built by Americans, meant to serve Americans. They no longer do, right? Uh, weapons that have been left behind have fallen into the hands of ISIS and the Taliban, right? So these physical things don't necessarily belong to us. And, and today, let's, let's take a very, very central issue in world politics today, and that's the Belt and Road Initiative, right? China has built railways and, um, and, and, and all sorts of infrastructures in very far-flung geographies, Africa, Latin America. It is not only plausible, it's already happening, that uh, the Chinese may withdraw from a certain country where they were planned to build, own, and operate exclusively infrastructure for their own neo-mercantile benefit and they're not in that country anymore. But guess yeah. what? The asset still serves those yeah. that are there. So infrastructure is, again, a different kind of a public good, if you will. Yeah. Uh, and again, it's something that one competes over and changes hands constantly over time. But you mentioned, too, but so what I liked about this, so if you think about this connectivity as an ellipse, you know, two focal points. One was sort of this, I'll call it the metaphysical, and the other is infrastructural. And the fragility... Of the, of the metaphysical or the human connectivity, and you're talking about the longevity of the infrastructural. It doesn't take much to destroy the human connectivity. Right? And we've seen this in the past years, or, or does it? Or do you feel like the human connectivity or that, that metaphysical is also something which will last longer? Well, I think it depends on sort of, you know, whom you ask, right? I do think that we can, we cannot claim that connectivity has homogenized us, right? On the one hand, you know, there, I do believe there is this impulse to find community and to use technology to connect. Again, it's not an accident, Chris, that the mobile phone is the most rapidly disseminated technology in human history, right? In a, a yeah. few short years, either every human being on the face of a planet will have their own mobile phone or a direct relative in their nuclear family will have one. That is astronomical. 30 years of history and every human being has one. What do you do with a mobile phone, Chris? <laughs> we connect, right? So let's face it. If everyone needed just one story, one anecdote, one data point to prove the metaphysical part of the argument, that might well be, be it. But, but again, you know, to, to echo Miriam's point from earlier, that doesn't necessarily inform us you know, convincingly or universally about how it will be used, right? You know, it gives us capacity, but it doesn't tell us the trajectory. And this is what Miriam's point was about, you know, sort of um, switching off right connectivity. We have globalization has waxed and waned over different eras, right? G connectivity is a capacity globalization is whether or not we're using it. The degree of globalization is whether we're using that capacity or not. Mm. But we have the capacity and we're building the capacity and we will just keep on and on building capacity. 
And it remains to be seen how, to what extent we or a future us, the future civilization uses it or doesn't use it and how they use it. Yeah, interesting. So Miriam, what do you think about that? And in a way it comes down to what you were saying before about the benevolent and malevolent utilization in a way. And um, Yeah. So um, I think you also asked about the limits uh, before, yeah. you know, where is, is there a limit to this type of connectivity that Parag is describing? And I think we would have to define what limit means because I don't think there actually is also when we now take Parag's use that, you know, there are different things and humans use them in different ways. So there is always change. And also when we look into history, this is exactly what happened. We've had uh, the Roman empire that fell, etc. We'll have the same again in the future. Things come and they go. Um, so I think there is not going to be a limit because human beings and there I would really echo Parag are, uh, constantly striving actually uh, for this as Parag says connectivity in different ways and I also like this concept of the capacity that this is something that can be used in different ways and that is obviously uh, what we don't know about the future is it how is it going to be used are there you know there's always um, an, an, a problem that we are deterministic when we see technologies that we believe a technology changes humankind that is not true uh, human beings have made technologies uh, and of course they shape social interactions, political interactions, economic interactions, but it is still us that shape technologies, even though they shape us. And the same, I think it can be said about the future. So if we open up the box and we think about this connectivity and how um, we can, you know, try and think about the future, knowing that there is so much connectivity. I think this uh, idea that we cannot fully understand always where it's going, that we cannot just project an idea. Maybe, you know, if we're an optimist, we think everything will be rosy. If we're a pessimist, we think everything will be uh, dark. I think it's always going to be both. And that is what challenges uh, human beings as well, because we cannot fully grasp the relationship between the connectivity, between the tools, the capacity, and what really, um, you know, comes to us in the future. It's a hugely complex system yep. uh, where so many different um, elements interact that the uncertainty of where uh, disruptions will occur or great innovations will occur is just very, very high. And in my opinion, also uh, unsolvable. There is, we need to live with uncertainties in the future. That's, that's my take. Interesting, absolutely. This uncertainty also leads into the, con the discussion around complexity. This, as we thought, you know, the variable, uncertain, complex, you know. So what's your feeling on this? Because for many, the future seems even more and more, more confusing and scary. Uh, one very often looks at the past with rose-colored glasses and everything was so simple. We knew this, we knew that. And I know, Prague, you also write about complexity and are thinking a lot about specifically this. I know, Miriam, you are as well. What are some of your thoughts on complexity and, and what do we need to be thinking about when we think about complexity? It is, um, even in retrospect, it's so difficult to piece together how certain events occurred when they did. You know, what was the confluence or collision of forces, deep, long-term historical trends, more immediate, and then triggers. How did those intersect to give rise to phenomenon X? And then even so after something has happened, it takes us a while to look back and say, aha, that's what, that's how it happened. Now imagine having the power to forecast, you know, with accuracy what's happening today and how it will collide tomorrow. And that, that's obviously in, in, uh, in natural sciences, you know, in, uh, in geophysics, right? Uh, this is not new, of course, you know, uh, so those who do climate modeling and so forth are precisely working on these issues and looking at atmospheric science and, and oceanic science and all of these things. And I think that's fascinating. And it's from those disciplines that ideally the social sciences will derive some lessons. And this is a interdisciplinary conversation that's been underway really since like the 1990s. And again, ETH has been, been looking at this since exactly then. But it's just very, very hard with social phenomena where there's almost no limits to what we could integrate 
into the model, right? And uh, so, but I'll, I'll call a couple of quick examples that really, you know, are striking from, from the present. Um, the Arab Spring, right? Um, only in retrospect did people look at the Russian heat wave of the year 2010 and how that led to Russia for the first time banning its wheat exports. And when it did so, it raised the price of wheat for Tunisia and Egypt, which were two countries that imported a lot of Russian wheat. And that led to the food price spikes and the, the growing desperation among the, uh, the farmers and others in the country. And that was one of the triggers of the Arab Spring. And if you knew that there was this correlation, then in the summer of 2010, you could have said, aha, there's going to be riots in Egypt and Tunisia in January 2011, because you know what? That's exactly what happened, right? Now, I'll give you another one. How about, how about this one? What if when we were, when Western companies and industrial economies started outsourcing their manufacturing to very low cost uh, Asian economies that were opening up to foreign investment in the 1960s, right? What if they had thought to themselves, wait a minute, this is going to lead to our own deindustrialization and the hollowing out of our you know, middle class industrial base in the Rust Belt. And they're all going to vote for Donald Trump uh, 48 years from now, right? Because if you want to know, if you want a single causal reason why Donald Trump was elected, I don't think it's Facebook. I don't think it's Russian manipulation, right? I think it is precisely those particular swing constituencies that voted for him. And what happened to those constituencies 50 years earlier? Their jobs started to disappear. So imagine having that kind of force. And we could go on and on and on, Chris. It's so yeah. much fun, isn't it? Right? <laughs> it yeah. is, actually. It's a lot of fun to try to do that. Yeah, yeah. Here we've just had a pandemic. None of us have used this word uh, pandemic yet uh, today. And we should really be devoting so much more attention to asking ourselves, how does a pandemic uh, collide with remote work, um, with also you know, mo mobility of people, with uh, demographic trends around, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, deflationary trends in global demographics, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the shifting fiscal position and the painful fiscal position that countries are in, and populist politics. How are all these forces now going to collide and which will pull which in what direction in the next four to five years? And that is the most interesting thing to be, uh, to be looking at today. And that's the perfect cliffhanger. If we were doing another show, we would end right there and say, and stay tuned for next time when the answer to our future will be shared. Because it is, of course, the multiple trillion dollar question is that. But I think what you just said, and Miriam, I'm going to come to you in just a second. It's really interesting, Parag, where you kind of, I'm, I'm totally fascinated where you pull back to with the Arab Spring to this instance of a decision which was made in another part of the world, which then had this trickle down, you know, this trickle through, like almost like the almost the proverbial butterfly effect, mm -hmm. which was the unintended consequence. Because when that decision was made in Russia, it was not they didn't say we want to create an Arab Spring. It was like we want to protect our own people. Right? and try to make sure that our people are taken care of. And then the same when in a decision was made with the outsourcing, and I think you also talked about the gold standard, the switch away from the gold standard as being uh, also something which had a long tail of ripple, right? Can I just say one thing, by the way? So, you know, in Switzerland, you recently had a referendum that failed around whether Switzerland should be forced to return to the, to the gold standard. But interestingly enough, had it not been for the de-pegging and decoupling and the collapse of the gold standard in the 19, in early 1970s, you really wouldn't have any uh, legitimation or justification for the thriving cryptocurrency market, which Switzerland now happens to be excelling at uh, being a key player in. So again, unintended consequences and butterfly effects, right? Yeah, that's great. Miriam, what is that? I mean, I think about this complexity and some of these unintended consequences when, with your with your filter, how do you see this? Yeah, so I find it interesting then complexity. If you study policy discourses, as I sometimes do, to see how policymakers talk about issues, you see that complexity is both a threat 
to, you know, a lot of also society sometimes because it actually does, you know, up this uncertain, these uncertainties and we don't fully understand where we, where we are at, how we should react and how our reactions will even, you know, influence our future. So it's both a threat, but also an opportunity. But first, let me talk about the threat because I think complexity as a, as a notion and as a, the interactive effects that Parag outlined have led to much more so-called wicked problems in, in the policy domains. Wicked problems are unsolvable. Um, at least there are no easy solutions because there are so many different parts, so many different stakeholders, so many different interests involved, and also a lot of uncertainties or uh, limited knowledge. So um, the connectivity that we talked uh, about before, the interacting or interactions between so many different subsystems, energy, you know, and the energy system, um, the financial system, social things, etc., lead to more wicked problems. And I think that's the future. We have to find ways how to deal with wicked problems better. And the, another aspect here is that, you know, politics is very local most of the time or national. That is one of the tasks. There is a nation state, even though it is true that, uh, you know, borders um, play a much more diverse role today than they used to, but still politics tends to look inward first. But all those problems, the big ones, are not global. They're, uh, sorry, are not national, they're global. So we face a double problem. We have extremely uh, hard problems to solve, plus we should solve them beyond uh, our normal governing mechanisms. And I think we're in a transition phase where we realize this. It's not new, but it's just becoming much more, more and more apparent that these issues, uh, that we need different solutions than we currently have, and that these solutions need to involve uh, many different stakeholders, that the state cannot do it alone. Mm -hmm. They need to talk to you know, civil society, and they need to talk to the private sector, and they don't even need to just talk to them, but find solutions together. And I think that's the new challenge. But there is the opportunity in, in um, complexity as well. It forces us to think about new ways of governing. And I think there, mm. if, we, if we capture this chance, then we have uh, huge opportunities ahead of us also using uh, you know, the new tools and the capacities that Parag outlined. Let me uh, respond to that. I really agree with what Miriam is saying. So the governance of complexity to me is the central challenge of the 21st century. And the, but it operates differently if we're talking about the national level versus the global level. The governance of complexity at a global level certainly requires far more multi-stakeholder coordination and networks and resource sharing uh, along the lines of which Miriam was just saying. At a domestic level, I think that we're starting to see in the wake of the pandemic which societies can, are doing a better or worse job of governing complexity because we have a case study now of an unexpected, uh, let's say exogenous phenomenon, uh, shock to the system. And so this is one of the things I've been thinking about for a while. I don't tend to work too much in this area of domestic politics and so forth, but I've been thinking about it more and more over the last year in particular, as we've seen the differences in the ability to cope with, with COVID. And what I've found is that what smart countries do um, is to you know, very strictly manage their flow and friction in terms of their borders and the things that are allowed in and the things that are allowed out and so forth. And so in some ways, what you notice, for example, here in Asia, Taiwan, Singapore, and New Zealand, well, they're physically islands, right? So not only are they physically islands, because of course, England is also an island. And it's not doing nearly as well as New Zealand when it comes to COVID, right? But it's about that constant paranoia that Taiwan, New Zealand, and Singapore have always had about what comes in, what goes out. And so if I could sum up in two words, the kind of principle that governs a paranoid state uh, that wants to survive a complex world, I would call it secure connectedness. Connectivity is key. You're talking about highly trade dependent states. Every island by definition is highly, highly trade dependent, connectivity dependent. So they need that connectivity, but they invest heavily in that domestic internal security and protection um, and that balance between flow and friction, security and connectedness is what is going to be at the heart of, uh, of, of countries successfully governing a complex world that is out of their control in the future. 
That's that's really fascinating. I love I love that this, this idea of secure interconnectedness and secure. There's always at various different levels of personal. I feel I feel secure. We are secure. You know, so there's this you know mentally, physically, uh, for now, for today, for tomorrow. That's actually. I think I, I, that's quite interesting, actually, to think about these different types of levels of that. Miriam, what do you think of that? This idea of secure interconnectedness is also a mental map looking forward. I think it's an idea that we in the West don't like at all, but are beginning to uh, understand much more. And uh, Parag has also uh, mentioned, you know, the, the global politics of the internet before. And we know that we have some states, um, by the way, not only autocratic states, but states are much more interested in controlling information flows as well nowadays than they were, uh, let's say, 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. So this notion that we have to um, go back to certain levels of control that have to do with a different kind of border, but also sometimes geographical, I think is on the rise. And we don't like it in the West because it goes against, you know, this whole political project also that we have in the European Union, where we want no borders. We would, don't want control anymore of a certain area. Um, so I think we are really just now realizing that in certain areas, uh, we would potentially have to talk about, you know, establishing more of those uh, controls or secure mm. spaces again. And I think this debate will have to be had. But I think it's also interesting that these are reactions to disruption. So we have a pandemic, it hits, we realize it's, it is, it's a pandemic, and now different states react differently. This is super interesting for us social scientists to study in the future to understand exactly, you know, the cultural aspects of where do these different ideas come from. But I find it even more interesting to also think about how are different polities or, or different regions also dealing with potential unknown threats now. We've had a pandemic. It's not that we didn't know that, you know, a pandemic could come. No, we've had warnings for years. Um, but obviously, you know, there's always a question, when do you act towards a certain threat or risk that's on the horizon? That is the much more difficult political question. So I think we also have to think about how are we governing the uncertain future, the uncertain uh, next big disruption. Um, there are many attempts, obviously, to think about these kind of potential risks in the future. Um, and I find it fascinating to see again how different states have different approaches and some are just blind completely because it's too political for them to touch. It's always hard, you know, if you start if you start putting your cards on the table and you say, well, we're going we're going to reduce the risk of X, Y, Z now in the future, you might be completely wrong. So that's why it's politically inopportune to act too early. But I do hope we can now talk about resilience, too, because that for me is one of the solutions that comes out of this uncertain space that we have in the future. So be before we pop on to the R word, I'd like, <laughs> which we, we will come back to. Miriam, thank you. Um, Barag, I, mean, I just, Miriam kind of threw out on the table this question, how do we govern for the next big risk? That was sort of a little, little great little question you just sort of flowed through there, Miriam. And what do you think, because you, I mean, you both work in this world of helping others think about the big risks. What's your thought on this? And, and, and the second part is, who's getting it right? Well, I'm not sure that we can, you know, govern the risk, but we can be prepared for it or try to be prepared for it. And this is, uh, I think, you know, we are transitioning into the resilience question by way of uh, drilling down uh, into this. So, you know, if it's a financial crisis, well, do you want to have adequate currency reserves? So let's take Singapore, tiny little country, much smaller than Norway, but a sovereign wealth fund that we don't know the exact uh, amount because it's a state secret, but it's a lot. And it's, you know, closer to what Norway's reserves are than, uh, than many other countries. Now they call this the rainy day fund. And in the last couple of years, a lot of people in the public said, you know, can't we just borrow a little bit from this rainy day fund to fund X, Y, Z? And the government said, nope, 
You just never know what's going to come. So let me give you a super concrete example here, real time, right? I mean, this government of Singapore is more or less closed borders. It's a tiny little country, most trade dependent country in the world. They're spending billions and billions and billions of dollars every month uh, to bail out everyone. You know, we're getting checks in the mail proverbially like every other week. But guess what? Our taxes will never go up ever. Why? Because they had this rainy day fund. They were prepared, right? So preparedness is the best preemptive resilience investment. Hmm. Now we could talk about any other kind of, but now here's a country though, that's a price taker in geopolitics, right? If China wants to march around and flatten everyone, uh, there's not much that Singapore is really going to be able to do, right? So you can be prepared for some things, not necessarily for, for other things, uh, but you can think about all of the potential risks and do whatever you can, right, accordingly. And I, I, think, I think that is the best that a government can do. But here's what should worry us so much uh, is that, you know, the pandemic, which in, you know, given how much information we had, could have taken advantage of and the resources at our disposal um, could have done such a better job of managing. So we should be very, very worried that if, the, if this pandemic has, can grind you know, dozens and dozens of economies to a halt, not only that set, you know, to, to, uh, to sort of um, take 10, 20% out of their economies in such a short period of time. Wow, we've got a long way to go in either being prepared or building resilience. Yeah, that's a very good point. And I think also just the ex examples we've seen of the differentiation in attitudes to reaction, which leads us to the, as you said, some nations are prepared for certain issues and some not, which brings us to that question of resilience. You know, it's, it's the R word. And um, what do we need to do? What should we do? Because the question here is how can we be better prepared for tomorrow, right? And, and I think both of you believe resilience and, and building better resilience is a keystone, I feel the cornerstone to this. And Miriam, I'm gonna give you the first word on it and Parag after. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you, you call it the, the R word because it's a very difficult term. It's uh, sometimes used, um, you know, in many different context, uh, contexts and people are, don't really take a lot of care to define it. Um, I'm not sure we need to define it here either because I just like one of the basic ideas about it. And that is that you do not want to prevent or you do not no longer believe that you can prevent bad things from happening. Um, some of them you can, you know, with the right risk management decisions, but many of them you will not be able to prevent. So you switch to plan B, which is once you are hit by whatever, you know, comes your way, you are just much better at dealing with it. Now, I think this idea of resilience relates back to the complexity and the connectivity, obviously, in very interesting ways. Um, it's much easier to see resilience in small networks because there you can even engineer it in, you know, if you want to engineer uh, a, a safe, uh, a resilient um, information network. There are, uh, there's a lot of research on that and a lot of clarity on how to do that. But if you scale it up, if you go from small networks up to the social networks and potentially global, you know, a global system that should be resilient and that is um, made up of humans and things um, that have very many different um, um, ways of interacting, etc., it obviously becomes super complicated. But I think one of the the important lessons from complexity research and uh, therefore also resilience as a, comp uh, as, as a concept is that we need to be able to adapt, you know, whatever situation comes along, whatever the threat was and however we got hit, we should be able, and I'm saying we as a society, to adapt as quickly and as as well as we can. And that is basically Parag's point as well. So you have okay. funds, you don't really know why and when you are going to, to uh, use them. Those aspects are not important, but you have something there that allows you to uh, boost that system back to a state of normalcy. Yeah. And 
that for me is the key in all kinds of levels. How we are going to do that, that are again, very difficult political questions because Paul yeah. also mentioned, it's a political um, you know, uh, decision to have something yeah. like that. That's great. Thank you. Uh, right, Parag, two seconds before you jump in, two seconds. I just want, I, I, I apologize to our audience. I've forgotten to let you know that you can pop questions into the Q&A uh, box and I will take a look at them and integrate those in the last 10, 15 minutes of our chat. Consciously pull them into the conversation and apologize. I didn't announce that earlier. I was so excited about our conversation that I just kept going. So Parag. Well, I think Miriam's raised such an interesting point that I, I could read that I never thought about this until right now. So, so if I, you know, I might stumble a bit, but let me try and formulate a question in, in real time. Are we achieving global resilience faster than we are national resilience? In other words, we're seeing states failing, you know, left, right, and center because of the COVID or because of climate change and so forth. But look at, let's look at the ways in which we're achieving global resilience. We're moving towards a post fossil fuel dependence world, right? We're distributing the capacity for solar, wind, nuclear power. So people can have local energy anywhere, right? That's number one. Another is financial markets, right? Countries, national countries are going bankrupt, debt is going through the roof, but we have enormous sums, infinite sums of global liquidity now that have been issued. And this, this ability of central banks and the IMF and others to backstop and provide uh, that, that capital where needed is, is, uh, is faster than ever before. Now we have climate change, you know, ravaging specific countries as sea levels rise or flooding or you know, temperatures rising, but we have entirely new geographies that we could build sustainable settlements in. So as a global society, in terms of our aggregate mm, sort of asset to cope with challenges, we're actually doing amazingly well, right? But individual countries are certainly failing uh, across the board in many of the areas of stress right now. Um, just something that's come, come to my mind. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to write this down and, and I'll write something about it and send it to you later. No, I think that's really a fascinating question. Again, it comes down to this, these different, she said, these different levels of resilience, right? And, and how, again, personal resilience, how, and even to our, into our bodies of making sure we eat well and things like that, that so helps our resilience all the way up to, as you say, national, global, and we're looking at climate change. And I think that's actually really quite, quite interesting. But we come back to the question of how to prepare for tomorrow. So how do we build that resilience? Is it a conscious movement? Is it a unconscious movement? You know, or, or a bit of both, right? What do you guys think about that? If I, if I may, I think it has to be conscious uh, even though some people are much better at being resilient anyway. I mean, that's a characteristic traits. We know that also from psychological research, of course. Yeah. No, but on the level of, of politics, I think it needs to be conscious because we have, we are still, or at least many states are still um, uh, kind of rooted in an idea of a technocratic future where you can have solutions, uh, or you have a, um, you know, a technology and outcomes to solution, or you just gather more data, have a better model, and then you know the future. That mindset is still very strong. And a lot of people still believe that expert can provide them knowledge that is, um, that, you know, that is decisionable in the sense of, again, this input output system, that there is no political deliberation and no values attached and all these kind of things. That is wrong. And I think that needs to be changed. And that is a discourse that scholars, for example, need to you know, start, um, they need to start engaging with, with politicians and policymakers much more about the limits of knowledge as well and what it actually means to not be able to know certain things. So that for me is like a learning process and learning is an aspect of resilience. Okay. And I like your idea, Parag, that obviously, you know, there are different, um, let's say, different levels that are not necessarily fully connected. Uh, and that, I think, scares us as human beings. And that scares politicians because they want to be reelected. Uh, or at least they, they think, you know, they have a certain function to fulfill and they uh, have to make promises and then make sure that this actually arrives. But what we are talking about is change. There is going to be change. There is constant change. There are things that we need to forget about. And that scares us as human beings. Most of us don't like this. 
But that for me is something that we need to train, to learn, to be more adaptive, to be more flexible, you know, to potentially let go, to be more, also more of, of, of risk taking needs, needs, yeah. needs to happen there as well. Well, by the way, I'm, I'm glad you used the T word, uh, technocracy, one of my favorite words, and the uh, title of one of my books. And uh, I think that the pandemic, uh, I think, validates technocratic uh, regimes. And, and it depends on your definition of technocracy. If you use my definition, which I believe is the uh, authentic and original, not because it's mine, but because I'm being faithful to its original usages from the uh, late 19th century um, from France, uh, and its allusions in some ways to the political philosophy of Plato and so forth, you know, tech, more technocracy would have been better, right, in managing this pandemic. And right, so the, uh, you know, having public health experts decide your health policy, God forbid, right, this kind of thing. So it's not about, uh, you know, the all knowing, uh, sort of tin eared central planning, uh, you know, sort of Soviet style. A bureaucrats. That's not what I'm talking about, right? I'm talking about sort of data-driven, expert-informed, uh, consultative, um, you know, respected authorities that are trained to do what they do in the public interest. That, to me, is a good technocracy. And again, we've we've seen, if nothing else, uh, here with this pandemic, the triumph of technocratic states, many of which are democracies. Taiwan, South Korea, you know, New Zealand, uh, you know, Japan are first-rate democracies, but what they have uh, more so in common is that they are first-rate technocracies as well. They have large, outstanding, well-trained, well-resourced civil services, and they're the ones that have managed uh, the government's pandemic response. We have just nine minutes left. It's gone by in a flash. And a few questions have come in that I'd like to just as a, around to future risks. I'd like both of you to say if you, what do you feel, you know, the World Economic Forum just put out their, you know, risk register, if you will. So I like to call it recently. I'm sure both of you are thinking about big risks. What do you feel if you're looking forward when we're thinking about being better prepared, what would you say are the one or two, maybe three big risks which all of those on the call really need to be thinking about? You first, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. All right. <laughs> Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Catch the futurists the by their toe. And, uh, you can only get it wrong. Okay, no, you no, you can't get it wrong. No, just just oh, a few we'll things. Alternate. Let's alternate. We'll okay, Parag, Parag, you give us one. That's, yeah. I think that's a good one, Parag. So a, a big thing I'm working on is how you know climate change will ultimately overwhelm our concept of sovereignty. Right, we're 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 still as a civilization today that common denominator that all societies share ultimately is that we respect this notion of sovereign borders. We may not respect it in day-to-day -day practice, but it exists and it's part of our own identity is modern civilization. Uh, but I think that climate change will ultimately stress that uh, to and past the breaking point. And we haven't yet conceptualized a way of transitioning, or maybe we've conceived of it or articulated, but certainly no state has done it, to move from thinking of you know, rigid sovereignty over territory to more of an administrative, um, you know, managerial kind of role over territory in which resources are shared much more fluidly and populations move more fluidly. So I think that is something that's very big and looming um, and a big theme that I'm working on right now. That's, that's big, that's looming. Fascinating. All right, Miriam, over to you. Yeah, so what I am most concerned about, it's, I think it's already here, but I think it's not going to go away in the, in the future, are societal inequalities and division. Um, it's much more, uh, it, it doesn't actually have to be material inequalities, though they also exist, as I mentioned with the connectivity, but it's really also in our heads that you know, these capacities that we are building are suddenly uh, no longer used to really uh, connect, but to build bubbles of mistrust, of, of hatred, etc. And that has huge repercussions for uh, what I think 
you know, also the, the future of connectivity, because there's going to be reactions to this as well. Bubbles of mistrust. So social inequality leading to bubbles of mistrust. That's a great one. Uh, okay, Parag, we've got time for one more for each of you, and then we're going to unfortunately have to bring today to an end. Um, I'm going to go with, okay, it was maybe it's a corollary to what uh, Miriam has said, but I do think that, uh, you know, the, the social divides stemming from economic inequality and, and the geographic inequality are probably irreparable and therefore bringing it back to this idea of sovereignty, I think we're going to see an acceleration of federalism to some degree, you know, places that simply do not trust their neighboring provinces or states or counties to make decisions for them in a collective way and choose to be somewhat more self-governing. So I think the what is in any case a global trend historically of decolonization and the splintering of states and the growth of states. Remember, we have 200 countries today. We only had 45 or 51 in 1945. So we've already tripled the number of countries, right? So it's not exactly something new, but yeah. this could accelerate uh, into the future as a result of what Miriam has said. Great. I like your little statistic of 50 something to 200 something in such in, an, in our parents' lifetimes. That's quite, right. quite amazing, yeah. Miriam, you get the last big risk. I get the, the last big risk. Yeah. Totally run out of risks. No. Oh, um, come on. <laughs> uh, it's really related again. And I think it's, it, for me, this is the big challenge. I mean, Parag has mentioned it with the climate change. Uh, we both said it with the societal divisions, the splintering. Uh, these are the tendencies that mm, kind of have a destructive effect on a lot of the positive uh, global um, you know, uh, leeways that we that we took in the last in the last, let's say, after the Second World War, that we are in yeah. a trend uh, where all these things are forgotten and we are splintering again. We are we are losing sight of the big global due to a variety of things, even though many of the problems are global. And I think these tensions between the very local and the very global, you know, and also the spatial new risks like climate change or uh, things like ra radiation, et cetera, et cetera. These for me are tendencies that have a risk to really disrupt um, our, our societies. You both had, it's very interesting to me um, how you both have honed in on this, this um, the divisions, the, almost the opposite of the connectivity. And you've, you know, where it's, in a way, less connectivity on different levels, right? Whether it's the personal, the federal, the global. When I think of this, I, I get very concerned about the, I think I'd share the first one, which was the, the long-term impacts of climate change and our inability to deal with it because we're already seeing so much of it right now. Um, what did I not ask you that I should have? And then we can just give me that question and then we can use that for the next one because I would, I would just love to have the two of you back on, on a channel of some kind to continue this conversation. What, what should I have asked you that I didn't? Something Miriam. That we could have talked about uh, are the different roles that you know, we as academic, for example, have or, or society has and, and politicians policy has and how to align those different views of the future and the roles. So how to actually move forward uh, with uh, interact interactions or whatever that would be a topic that we could have spent some more time on all right i will note that for the next time miriam that's great parag what did i not ask you that i should have asked you so i'll for once say something short and sweet which is um, uh the question should have been um where to retire <laughs> where in the world um, be a safe place in the year 20 30 40 or 50 I have the answer. And no, no, we're going to leave that for the next, we're going to leave that for the next iteration on the show. And I, but Parag, I, I am going to give you a moment. You have a book coming out very soon. Oh, well, is I, that, that is the book that answers that question. Uh, <laughs> there you go. So there you go we'll for everybody. In uh, October or November this year. Awesome. I believe the title of that book is? Move. 
The title of Prague's book is Move. It will be coming out in October, November of this year, both in English and in German and other languages. And, uh, you know, thank you. I just for that moment. So I want to thank everybody for joining us this morning, this evening, this afternoon. And most especially, I'd like to thank Parag and Miriam for your time, for your insights, for your wisdom, for your passion, and for your work on helping to make the world a better place. I think it's really been um, really been wonderful. I've learned from you and I thank you. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. That's great. So I'd like also to the audience, thank you so, so, so much. And we have our next talk will be on the 25th of February at two o'clock in the afternoon, Central European time. That's 1400 hours of Central, Euro um, Central European time with two, another great group, two people. Uh, Cynthia Hansen, she is the head of the ADECO Foundation and also on the board there, and Manu, Professor Manu Kapoor from the ATI Zurich. And our theme there is going to be the future of work, as well as how do we help those underserved groups get back into the workforce. And we're looking about teaching, learning, and what does this mean? So I hope you'll be able to join us on the 25th of February. And again, Thank you so much. Stay safe. Take care of those you love and be connected. So we'll see. Thank you both. Thank you so much. Thank you.